us if you so wish. All right, we're, uh, we're changing gears a little bit now. Uh, we have been looking at the kinematics and kinetics, in other words, the dynamics of particle motion. Now we're going to do rigid body motion. Kind of like we did in uh, Physics 1. We also started there with particle motion. Went through very much some of the same stuff we went through here. Uh, what we've done here I, I hope was worthy of being a year farther along in your studies. A more in depth. Was it Alex? Yeah. Definitely. Um, and then once we got to about the same point, then we stepped into rigid body motion, just uh, like we're going to do now. Though, of course, we'll, we'll take it a little bit farther. Um, in physics one, when we got to rigid body motion, all we looked at was simple, pure rotation. We're going to revisit that. A uh, good portion of it is review. Um, but then we're going to take it a little bit farther. Uh, we've looked so far at translation of particles, and the translation of rigid bodies is very much the same. Um, that came in both linear and curvilinear fashion. In other words, 1D and 2D type motions. 3D motions, we looked at a little bit. Uh, we won't really visit that much. And now we're going to look at uh, the rotation of rigid bodies. That's what we'll spend most of the day doing. And then we're also going to look at the two of them together, which we'll call general plane motion. The, uh, the easiest type of uh, example to see of that, uh, that you'd be most familiar with, is a car tire. Uh, as the car, as the tire is rolling along the road, it's in rotation about a central point. However, that point itself is in translation, uh, especially a car tire going over the Adirondack Hills like we do, where it's going up and down. A uh, very good example of rotation and curvilinear translation together of a rigid body being uh, very much general plane motion. In fact, that would be actually be general uh, 3D motion uh, if we actually look at the, all the possible things you can do driving around the roads and like. All right, the surface first. We'll take a quick look at our definition of a rigid body. Because certainly we can get any kind of an object, but we need some strict definition to allow us to say, yes, that's a rigid body, uh, as opposed to some other thing. Um, we will look at, at things like linkages, which are um, individual rigid bodies put together in such a way that together they're not a rigid body. So we'll get to that study very, very shortly. But a rigid body, for our purposes, is any object where we can put any three non-collinear points on that object. That then, of course, describes a triangle. So any arbitrary triangle can be inscribed on a rigid body. And no matter what that rigid body does, that triangle will not change. So any side remains the same length, any angle remains the same. Not just similar, the triangles don't change in some way that they remain similar triangles. It's always the same triangle. Any arbitrary triangle we could trans, uh, inscribe on that object, uh, whether we do it, uh, actually do it, or just virtually do it, um, will not change in shape or form. Can, however, of course, change in orientation. 
you can't imagine if we're going to have something rotating about a central point, that triangle is going to change in its orientation, but no aspect of that triangle will change. And that's our definition then of rigid body, of, of a rigid body. So I guess if we want to formalize it, we'd say uh, something like A, B, and C are, well, I don't know what it means to say. Oh, well, yeah, that's the sides, not the points. Uh, so A, B, and C are constant in magnitude. And the angles that go with them are also constant. However, anything we use to locate these points, whatever we might call them, I guess we can give them capital letters, and then say that the location vectors of the three points may or may not be constant. Uh, if we're going to have rotation about a central point, and one of those, and that central point happens to be A, B, or C, then the position vector of that point would be constant, but then as all the other points rotate around it, none of the other location vectors would be constant. And also for the velocity vectors, they might be constant, they might not. And of course, the same for the acceleration vectors. My God. It depends on what the points are doing, uh, what the points are, and what the uh, what the piece is doing. Simple enough, I hope, makes sense. Now you see it, it's something you probably could have come up with. You can imagine some committee some, sitting down somewhere and coming up with this type of thing. Uh, so we'll start our look in rigid body, no, no, uh, rigid body motion, just like we did with physics one, where we'll look, look at pure rotational motion first. The translation, we don't really need to revisit too much, though we will a little bit, but it's the pure rotational motion that generally needs uh, a bit of review for most students. So it's rotation about a fixed point or axis. So the simplest thing we can do is, is imagine it's a disk. Our rigid body will be a disk, though it need not be. And rotating about some fixed axis. Uh, if it is rotating about an axis, as anything would be, uh, I don't know how it rotates about a single point alone, I guess. Um, then at any point on it, we can inscribe a reference line. And then our first uh, idea about position is any change of that reference line with time. changes in position will be simply an angle made from the original reference direction, whatever that might be. And remember the, the units on this 
are radians. We might talk about degrees because I don't know about you, if somebody says some angle and radians, I don't necessarily uh, quickly understand what they're talking about. I have to think about the transformation. But then I make the transformation in my mind to degrees anyway uh, because that's what we're most familiar with. It's, it's kind of like the, the way people can talk to us uh, in the metric system, but then in our head we're still converting things over to the English system because that's what we're used to in America. All right, so we'll look at, at changes in that position with time, and that, of course, will give us then uh, angular velocity, just like it did in physics one. We use the symbol omega, which is kind of a kind of a fat round W. And the average angular velocity is the change in angle with time. And then just like we did in uh, physics, we define then the differential as time goes to zero, giving us the instantaneous velocity The very, very same type of thing we did in, uh, in Physics 1. And if you remember, and I hope you do, uh, everything we did in terms of particle motion, especially translation, has a direct and, um, uh, direct and intimate allegory in terms of the rotational motion. All you have to do is take out any equation we had in translational particle motion swap out the position velocity and the acceleration symbols and you've got the same equations. Uh, we'll amplify on that a little bit here. Uh, because there is, uh, we do need to know a little bit more complete things about it than we did in uh, uh, Physics 1. And then we also have the instantaneous acceleration. It's the average acceleration as that time period goes to zero, becomes an instant, the, the limit. And then uh, all the other choice symbols we could put with it. So hoping that hope, hopefully that looks somewhat familiar as it should. So uh, Remember that any equations we had before, we now have, uh, in translation, we now have exactly the same thing in, in uh, rotational motion. Um, you just need to swap out the variables. So, for example, we had the uh, translational We have the translational acceleration equation, and now we have the equivalent rotational motion equation. Uh, just the definition of the acceleration there. Obviously, if the acceleration is constant, the average acceleration and the instantaneous acceleration are always equal. What other constant acceleration equations do we have? Uh, delta S equals one half A T squared plus B I T. Swap out position, put in theta, swap out acceleration, put in alpha, swap out velocity, 
and we get the exact same form in, uh, in, for rotational motion. So our constant acceleration equations don't really change. You don't need to get a new tattoo. Your old one will suffice. All you have to do is swap out the uh, symbols and you get the rotational form straight away. Remember we had four constant acceleration equations? What was the fourth? Check your tattoo. That, what was it again? Average velocity is delta S over delta T. Of course, in constant acceleration, the velocity changes linearly. And the way you find the average of any number is by adding them together and dividing by the number you had. So it's just a straight arithmetic average. And we get the last of our rotational constant acceleration equations. So we have four constant acceleration equations for either translation or rotation. At this point, remember, we're not doing both at once. We're only doing one or the other. And right now we're focusing on rotation. But we still have the, uh, the very same four equations and the like. All right. For the special case of constant acceleration, however, in this class, we're, uh, we're not going to stay strictly with that. So we have a little bit more we can look at. If you remember, We did have one equation looks something like this in translation. Remember that one? That came about from the definition of velocity and the definition of acceleration. Combining those two equations and eliminating the dt, we got that equation. That served us very well for those times when we had an acceleration that was a function of position. So that was one of our most useful uh, non-constant acceleration equations. If acceleration is constant, you go ahead and integrate that, you end up with, uh, with the third form that we have there anyway. So we have a rotational equivalent then. That, uh, that we can use for those times when alpha is a function of beta or the angular acceleration is a function of the angular position. All right. Now we're going to expand things a little bit, take them a little bit farther uh, than we really did in, in physics one. So, oh, one other thing. One other thing I want to do with this. Remember that... Uh, Angular acceleration, angular velocity, and angular position are all vectors themselves. 
where the vector direction, whether it's theta or omega or velocity is all done with the right hand rule. Put your hand in the direction of the turn, your right hand, and the thumb will give the vector direction of that uh, that uh, that change. So it's sort of like a quasi two-dimensional. The objects we're looking at uh, might be planar and turning in a plane. However, the uh, vector that represents those we allow to be in the uh, third dimension for uh, a way for us to describe this. So for example, I've illustrated what the positive direction might look like, or not necessarily positive, but what the, what the vector representing those motions would look like with the right hand rule for, for a particular example shown in rotation. All right, so let's open things up a little bit. Imagine we have some object rotating about some fixed axis. And we want to know something about the nature of motion of a position, a point on that object. So it might have some angular position relative to some reference. So that's, that's easy enough to understand, I guess. At, at some certain time, that angle P that describes our describes the position of that point P. Uh, certainly could be a function of time. We did expect it to be, as a matter of fact, otherwise things aren't moving. But some other things that are more interest to us possibly are things like what the velocity of that point might be. I'm trying to draw it so that vector is lying right on that disk because if that disk is turning in its own plane, then the point P must always remain in that plane as well. And then we know the magnitude of the velocity of that point is the distance it is from the axis of rotation times the angular speed of the uh, object itself. That's generally pretty easy if uh, that RP, the, 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 the minimum distance the point is from the axis, uh, is known. If that's not known, we're going to need something a little bit, a little bit more robust. And we can then uh, find the velocity of that point at any time by taking the cross product the other way where this is this RP vector is from anywhere 
on the axis of rotation to point P. That might in some problems be a little bit easier. We might not, we might know some point down here or even up there and it's just for whatever reasons a lot easier to know what that vector is from that point rather than uh, uh, knowing exactly where the center of rotation is. So that cross product form then could help us. And you can check it. Um, it's a little difficult because now we're working in three dimensions. But if the axis of rotation is as shown, then there's our omega vector straight up. Uh, rotation, and this is something students forget a lot, this vector, the, the rotational motion vector is a floating vector, which means it works, it's the same anywhere on that object. So you, you might see the cross product a little bit better if we draw it like this, then an omega crossed into R is going to give you the velocity vector of that point. Remember, the cross product is uh, also done with the right hand rule where you put your fingers in that direction of that vector, move them the shortest distance to the direction of that vector that orients your thumb then in the direction of the vector you're trying to find. So omega crossed into R will put your thumb in the direction of uh, the velocity of that point. Just to clarify, the, yep. the omega that's uh, the curved one, that's the angular velocity, and then the one that's going straight up that we were just talking they're, about? They're one and the same. Oh, the same. They're one and the same. It's just, this is a, this is a more of a, uh, uh, just a, a I don't know what to call it. Kind of like a graphical, graphical demonstration of what the angular velocity is. This is our vector representation of that that we use for any calculations, especially cross product. This kind of thing is not a true vector and we can't put it into a cross product. This is a vector and can work in a cross product. Very seldom in this class are we going to have to actually do these cross products but there are times when we're going to have to imagine them. Most often, we do know the perpendicular vectors and the cross product itself is a perpendicular result from that. But we have it if we need it. Uh, and in some cases we will, but more often than not we just need to uh, use it to conceive the, the the direction because most of our problems are going to be two dimensional problems rather than three dimensional. All right, uh, the other possibility we need to look at, of course, is that this point P of interest, whatever that might be, maybe we've got something attached there. Um, we're going to be spinning a lot more things than just disks here. Um, we might also be concerned with the fact that there could be some angular acceleration of this object causing point P to have a tangential acceleration but if you remember from points going in circular motion, there's also a normal component of the acceleration as well. And so we have to have both of those. Acceleration of point P is that component in the tangential direction and that component in the in the tangential direction, point P in the normal direction,
And both of those we remember. Let's just not bother with the point P thing, just use the tangential component. Remember that a point going in a circle, as point P must, a point going in a circle will only have a tangential velocity, so the tangential acceleration is any change in that velocity. And it's related to the angular acceleration depending upon its particular distance from that axis. If we need it in a more complete way, we can also do that as a cross product where again that r position vector rp locates that point from any point along the axis of rotation whether it's the center point of rotation or just some place that might be more convenient anywhere along the axis of rotation doesn't really matter and the normal acceleration, if you remember, what was that? Uh, R omega squared, V squared over R. Remember, R is not the radius of the object. The radius of the circle the point P is on. And that also can be done as a cross product. though a little bit more involved one. And again, this is the location of point P relative to anywhere from that axis. This last little quantity, that omega cross R, uh, well that is VP, so this is also that omega cross P. And we can check that. Uh, remember, this normal acceleration for an object going in a circle as point P is, is always directed towards the center. And if we do omega cross VP, omega cross to VP, our thumb is going right towards the center of the rotation, just as it should be. So this does indeed give us the centripetal acceleration that we'd expect. I guess we could write it as uh, R omega squared EN and a minus meaning it's towards the center. Remember the normal direction is, uh, is typically taken as out. So we've got all the pieces there we can do, we can do, we can do all kinds of damage now. However, again, uh, we don't actually have to do those cross products very often. Um, mostly though they're useful for visualizing to get to get an idea if the direction uh, you're considering is appropriate. <coughs> oh, I hate to erase it. Such a pretty picture. Sure Any more question? Normal acceleration. Why is it negative r omega squared? Can anybody tell them? Because it's, it's supposed to actually go outwards instead of inwards. The, the so normal direction is typically outwards. All right. Remember, as, we, as we, we set this up when we did our normal and tangential uh, components, 
So an object moving along some path has a velocity along that path. That sets the tangential direction. And then the normal direction was perpendicular to that, away from the center of curvature. And of course, as that object moves anywhere along that path, then the normal tangential coordinate system moves with it. It's not a big deal when something's moving in a circle because that, that change in these is so predictable. A little more difficult if you're along some general curvilinear path. Okay, so let's do some problems just to warm up on this. Remember, we don't very often have to do the cross products. So imagine we have a wheel rotating about its axle. The speed increases uniformly from 25 radians per second. No, sorry, from 10 radians per second to 25. in 10 seconds. Find AT and AN at five seconds of some point P. Which is one foot from the center. Can we uh, normally assume that if it's not said it's going counterclockwise? Uh, yeah, if, if it doesn't say uh, you can assume that, or just sketch it on there if you want. Um, you know, it's the same thing if we had uh, a particle motion, we said it's moving with 10 meters per second. You can draw it moving to the right or the left or up and down, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so feel free to just designate that in the picture. Uh, we can say, though, as a class policy, if unless stated otherwise, in the positive direction, which would be counterclockwise, give us a, a vector out of the board. Also find the total distance that point P travels. Okay, so just a bit of a warm up. Getting used to again the, this rotational motion business.
halfway through this thing, we want to know what the tangential and normal acceleration is. Also, the total distance that point P travels. So in this one, uh, all those cross products are pretty easy. Remember the cross product of perpendicular vectors has a magnitude uh, of the product of the magnitude of the vectors. acceleration problem did I say that yeah so this is a constant acceleration problem because I said the speed increases uniformly didn't write it down but I said it five seconds So any of the constant acceleration equations will work. 
Acceleration. Does this one change at all? Because I didn't put in for five seconds. How do we do the fact that it's that at five seconds? Constant acceleration. Alpha is constant. Is this then constant? How do we find the normal acceleration? The centripetal acceleration. R omega squared. R is constant, certainly, but omega is not. So the, the angular acceleration is actually increasing. How do you find uh, omega? Remember, this is at five seconds. Yeah. Initial angular velocity plus the uh, change in angular velocity. Yeah, or uh, if you notice, since it's a linear increase and our five seconds at the midway point would be just the average velocities. Uh, either way, it comes out to be the same thing. So what's the average of that? 17 and a half? Don't forget, it's squared. That's a very easy thing to forget in, in uh, these things we're doing here. So what'd you get for that then? 306 feet per second squared. And then the total distance traveled, delta S is R delta theta. And delta theta we can find from constant acceleration equations comes out to be an absolutely gigantic number that no one's ever seen before, a number that big. Good thing you're sitting down, aren't you? Uh, so the T is the 10 seconds for the total distance. Alpha we have from above. Uh, omega 1 was given. Do you want to Avert your eyes while I write this down, Jay. 175 radians. So how many times around is that? Divide that by what? Two pi. So divide that by about six. Since R is one foot, we got just that. All right. 
warm up, simple one. Could have done that back in physics, physics one. So we'll do a little bit, a uh, little bit more involved problem now. This will be your get out of class question. So we have a winch system with a small motor here driving a larger wheel there, and the winch, the the lifting cable is actually wrapped around the center there. And we have a load attached to that. Now, uh, unstated here, but something we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to. It's going to be very, very important to us because if it's not true, then all of this that we're doing for the next couple weeks becomes a lot harder. Um, you can imagine that this would work best if these were geared wheels in connection with each other. Uh, I'm not going to draw all those teeth, so you have to just assume they're there. But what that means to us is that there's no slip between those two. That as one turns, it's intimately connected with the other one and will uh, cause it to turn uh, perfectly in response. So we'll, we'll call that wheel A. This is wheel B. No, outer ones. C, just to keep them straight with what I have. The radius of A is 50 millimeters. Radius of B is 100 and C is 200. All right, so the motor at A starts from rest begins to turn counterclockwise. Sorry, clockwise at an angular acceleration of 0.2 T radians per second squared. So, A starts to turn clockwise. That will cause C to turn counterclockwise, causing the load to start to rise. You're to find, after 10 seconds, these two things. How far does the load travel? How much does it rise? And the velocity of the load after five seconds. Okay. Again, a nice planar motion, so we don't actually need any of the cross products here. Sorry, was there a question? No questions. Perfectly understood. Alright. So there's your there's your get out of class question. You can start the weekend early. Bob's calling the homies. Tell them to get the beer on ice. We'll be out of here early today, guys.
going to be the ratio of their, their radii. Is it going to be integral from like 0 to 10, or do you just put 10 in for the t? Oh, you tell me. Right. That will give you this acceleration as a function of t, because that was a function of t. So you'll have the acceleration of b as a function of t. Once you have that, then you can find the change in speed. And since starts from rest, that will give you the uh, angular velocity at any particular time t. Then the change in angle is the same type of thing. Velocity is not constant. How are you going to get the distance turned from that? Because it's the distance yeah. turned. I realized once I, I realized once I got to that part, I had to take the derivative. <laughs> the derivative of what? The derivative of angular velocity. If you take the derivative of it, you're going to get the acceleration. Yeah. You're going to have the acceleration. Exactly. I said I had to go back, but I didn't actually go back. That's what you want to do. Two integration. Get this integrated to some time t, and then integrate that to get the distance in 10 seconds. And then that will give you uh, The, the change in height. No? Yeah. Oh, let's see. I didn't know you're already ready. You you snap into action when it's get out of class question. <coughs> uh nope. Not what I got. Or neither. Well, let me see here. Oh no, the velocity looks okay. Oh, okay. Let's check mine. I know one of these has at least got me incredibly wrong. Dude, That's this makes no sense. It makes our velocity in delta s make no sense. Velocity. Now. That's. This is rotating. No, look how it's rotating. Ah, Jesus. This has got to go up. All right. Uh, you know, a lot of times the sense is just from whatever is in the picture. Okay. Don't uh, don't put in minus signs that are going to screw you up. Nope. Know what I got? Either one. One mom. So are you? What's the solution to this problem? Yeah, we'll we'll do this solution in a couple hours. Okay. All right. Are we getting tired, hungry, sleepy? No. 
texting the boys to come get you. Springing loose. Yeah, that's what I got. That's that's a point. Yeah. yeah. Getting to have them on a zero in front of those decimal points so they don't disappear. It's not wrong if you don't, but there's some day you're not going to see that decimal point. So like you need to put a line over it or you photocopy enough times it disappears. Just a precaution, just one of those professional techniques we should use. Nope, not quite. Alright, let's do it for Bob. <laughs> let's see. Uh, so, um, alpha B here is going to be R A over R B alpha A, right? And those ratio, what's that ratio? Uh, oh, actually, no, that's a C. We need a C in there, not B. Well, that's okay if that's a B, but not on the radius. So the ratio of the radii is what? Four. So the so one fourth. So the angular acceleration is 0.05 t. Is that right? I think. So if we integrate that, that'll give us the change in angle, but the original angle is zero, so it'll give us then the speed of b at any time t since we're only going to integrate up to any time t. So, what's that integral become? 0.001 t squared? 0.001? 0.0025. Power comes down, raise the power by one, and zero zero two five t squared. That's the speed of b at any time t, because we integrated from zero to t. The initial speed was zero at t zero. So this integral becomes the the speed of b at any time t. So we can use that then to get the change in angle of b by now integrating 0 to 10 seconds. And then that change in angle times the radius of b will tell us how much we raised point l. Delta 
H. So I just multiply it by the radius B. And what was the other piece I asked you to find? The, oh, the velocity of the L. How are you going to find that? VL equals RB omega B. And we know omega is a function of B. I mean, as a function of t, so we can just put in the 10 seconds. Makes sense? Text those homies, Bob. You're coming. Colin, what was wrong? It's not constant acceleration. Don't use the constant acceleration problems for non-constant acceleration. Once we know how the angle B is turned through, we just multiply by the radius of B. Okay, got the last piece, Jake? Got the first piece, Jake? Now, the velocity is the question. We have the angular velocity of B with time, so you can just put it in there and evaluate the whole thing at the 10 seconds. Because we have that, right? Yeah. We have 10 seconds. Ten, ten, ten. Said 10 seconds. I had the same answer as I did last time. Is that still wrong? Oh, millimeters. Uh, yeah. Something wrong. Um, oh, come on, Alex. Here's your problem right here. T squared. Uh-oh. That's why you're off by a factor of 10. 